So like talking about any mentors in your life besides your dad, like were there any other people that you want to like bring up that really kind of like showed you the ropes and have made you the woman you are today? Yeah, there's a couple of people that stand out. Um, so before I joined Weed Man, which is probably one of the best things that I did, you know, of course he bought it when I was 16, I went to university. I also uh, decided to work at the University of Ottawa where I was going. And because of that, I was able to go to university for free. So I would, um, so I went in, I walked in and got this job. I started off just filing and um, doing a few odd jobs and I, I needed money. So I just literally walked into an office and said, Hey, is there anything you have that I could do for you? And I just happened to walk into the right office at the right time. And they said, yes, there is. In fact, we have filing and, and whatnot which then led to me working at the university full time in a position. Um, I was the liaison officer, so they had distant education. So they had a teacher at the University of Ottawa, and then they would teach all the way up, way up north in remote centers. And back then they had an electronic chalkboard and speakers at all the desks. So I would go in and be able to wire desks and make sure the teachers, all the the information from the teacher was out in the centers and the coordinated tests and, and whatnot. So I did that. And my boss at the time was Don McDonnell. And he was just really a great, great first boss. He was this man that kind of would give me a little bit of the, you know, you don't know when you're young, you're walking in that, that even politics exists in an organization. And he would pull me aside and he say, okay, when they ask, the girls ask you to go to lunch and, you know, the front office asks you to go to lunch, you go, but you don't go all the time. And don't get bogged down in the, the conversations when they start talking about the boss and because those conversations will come back to, to bite you. So that was one uh, piece of advice that he gave me that I thought, wow, you know, I'm just kind of learning the ropes. The second piece of advice, and I didn't really realize it was advice at the time, uh, but when, before I left, I realized what he was doing. So every time if I had an issue or something came up, I would go into his office and say, okay, this is the issue. I don't know, you know, what should we do? And he'd go, you have the answer. Go back to your desk, think about it and come back to me with a few solutions. So he I did that enough times that I stopped going to him. So maybe he was smarter than I thought. Um, but it made me start to think of solutions that every problem has a solution. You just got to think about it and be strategic about it. And how do you prevent some of these things from happening? So then instead of going into his office to just discuss the issue, we were now going, I was going into his office to discuss the solutions and the different opportunities. So that was really a helpful thing. And I've used that a lot in my career, uh, using that strategy with people, because it's so much more fun to talk about solutions than talk about the issue. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so that was, that was good. Now, of course, my dad and, you know, I don't want to talk too much about that because I'll cry. So we'll skip over that. But he's meant clearly a lot to me and, and my life and, and, you know, both professionally and personally. Um, but also when we went into the U.S., uh, we solicited, um, we have what we call sub-franchisers. So they're really our partners, but we sold large geographic areas so we were the master franchisor and then some we um we met some really great people and we sold them a sub territory which meant that they would buy a large geographical area and then they would sell franchises in that area and also uh support the franchisee so we would support the sub the sub would support the franchise in half of the us and the other half it's direct to us so Everything that we do, we kind of there, we run through them. So they also have operations as well. So they have a weed man franchise. They're a sub. So they're kind of in the thick of things. We use them as testing areas. But every decision that we make, we make as a group. And, um, you know, originally we had 13 and now we have we have 10 of those subs. Um, and every single one of those uh, gentlemen happens to be gentlemen. Some of them are couples, but have challenged me to a certain degree, have coached me, have mentored me. So it's been 
so cool to have um, so many different perspectives and, and, you know, they, these guys were very successful before they joined Weedman. Most of them had built a lawn care company, sold to True Green, and then got back in after their non-competes were done. So they brought all of that experience to the table, all of that doing business, maybe a little differently than we did and working with them to bring them into our systems and them speaking our same language and learning from them has been instrumental in my, in my career. And, you know, I've often been the only woman in the room, but have never felt like the only woman in the room. And it's because of them, you know, being there and supporting me and allowing me to be who I am. I mean, I, I've been doing, uh, you know, before becoming CEO, I was the chief chief, whatever that means, operating officer. So I've been kind of doing this role for a long time. And without them, I, I wouldn't be who I am today, for sure, for sure. Well, you said thanks to them. I would say a lot of that and also thanks to you just fitting in in the room and just, uh, you know, because I, I think people have to feel comfortable on both sides. This is one of the things that I always, when I'm mentoring my daughter, you know, is just to remind her that, um, you know, it, it, it's like, I'll say it like this, if, I, if I'm going to be in a room full of women, I have to fit in with the women. And if you're going to be in a room mm-hmm. full of men, fit in with the men, you know? Yeah. Um, and it's one of the things that this might get me into some trouble and I might get some bad emails back on my podcast for that. But, but I mean, at the end of the day, we're all human beings and people just want to feel comfortable with people. So it sounds like they made you feel very comfortable, but it likely is because you also made them feel comfortable. And I just want to make sure that I express that as a man talking to you because uh, yeah. it's important to say, you know. Yeah, you know, you're, you're right. Um, you know, there's so many taboo things that you can't talk about, but It would be even if I was a man, if I walk into a room and demand respect, probably not going to get it right. If I come into a room and earn respect, that's whether you're a woman or a man, you have to be self aware of yourself and and what you're behaving. So I, I don't think you're saying anything wrong. I think you're pointing out a very relevant point, you you know, just because I'm a woman, I shouldn't demand respect. I need to earn it and I need to work hard to earn it. Um, So that was, uh, you know, one of the things that I always, you know, I'm when I sit in a room, I often think I am, uh, I am definitely not the smartest person in this room. Definitely not. Uh, But can I outwork? Most people I can. And I, that's something that I take pride in. And everyone knows that, like, you know, if there's somebody working on a Sunday night, they know it's probably me out working to make sure everything's okay. And, and that's just who I am. Um, so I think that's where I've earned most of their respect. You know, a lot of people ask me the question, you know, what's it like being a woman in the room? And it's like, well, it's probably tougher being the daughter of the CEO, or a young person when I first came in to understand all the dynamics and sit back. So, you know, when you asked me that first question, when we first started, um, you know, my parents allowing me to be at the table and listening and and being an active listener um, has really helped me. It really helped me um, be able to, to read a room very, very well. Yeah. Well, and I think you bring up, I, I, first of all, I, I want to expand on the statement of you saying you're not always the smartest person in the room. Uh, I say that, and, and I think that some of the most successful people actually do a really good job of making sure they're not always the smartest person in the room because it means you're not going into enough rooms. You know, it's like for my listeners, like if, if, if you're the smartest person in the room all the time, you're living an isolated life, you know? And that's right. Yeah. And you're not learning from other people. And, yeah. uh, and then secondly, you know, to elaborate on, on the problem solvers, you know, obviously I have a lot of employees and, and I actually tell my, my team members at the end of the day, just hire problem solvers, you know, because I think the most successful companies are the companies that have the most problem solvers on staff, you know, yeah. it doesn't make a difference what industry you're in. So I see these companies that try to, you know, 
get these people that are like siloed off, like I have a really great marketing team or I have a really great sales team. But my question always is, but how do they interact to solve problems? Because, yeah. because people use the service industry to solve a problem. You know, in your industry, mm -hmm. it's, I don't want to fertilize my own yard. Every time I do, I brown it out and I stripe it and I do all sorts of weird stuff. So solve my problem. You know, yeah. contractors, like even like myself, I, I have to tell you, you know, uh, Jennifer, you brought up True Green. Like when we were smaller, we did the fertilizing in-house. And the reason we did is I was not immune to hopping on a, on a permagreen and going and hitting all my Chase banks because they needed to be done on a Saturday, you know, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And then I got bigger and said, ah, no more permagreen for Joe, you know? And then I didn't have great, it's like, I felt like, like the people doing it for me, I wasn't getting the results when I went to True Green. Then I didn't like that big corporate feel, you know? So I'm sure like, as I'm saying this, I would probably be the perfect fit for Weed Man, you know, like, because, you know, you, you would need, be. yeah, because you need that like small, like, because, because I have zero desire to fertilize, you know, mm -hmm. because I will admit, it seems like every time my people do it, every time I hand it back off to my Langton people, something happens like somebody's tomato plants die three yards oh. away. Right. And then, <laughs> and then I'm going and researching it, you know, and, and, yeah. and I say that I'm saying this on the podcast because, you know, I, I think that our industry, you know, to make it more professional, sometimes um, people in our industry want to try to be the problem solvers or the professionals at everything. And I think sometimes we have to understand and identify the things we can, the problems we can solve easiest with the skill set we come into and then either contract out or get involved with the people that can solve the other problem. And whether that's yeah. hiring people or joining organizations like yours um, or getting involved with, I think that's the way forward. And that's my two cents to the industry, you know? Um, yeah. So, um, so to, unless you want to elaborate on that, do you want to? No, it's very well said, very well said.